Generations have trod, have trod, have trod. Gerald Manley Hopkins is the poet. The poem is God's Grandeur. I am Jermaine Hatton and today is the 3rd day of July 2017. On this version of the recap, we will take a dive into British poetry and in the likeness of Gerald Manley Hopkins. Gerald Manley Hopkins, as we know, is a British poet. In fact, he is dubbed the most remarkable British poet or English poet in the Victorian period. The Victorian period generally marks the shift or the transition from romantic poetry or romantic writing into different literature of the 20th century. Nothing too much of significance there. But let's go straight into that. Gerald Manley Hopkins uh, is generally recognized for his nice rhythmic effects in his poetry. In fact, he uses new he uses similar words or known words in surprising and new contexts. Uh, Gerald Manley Hopkins, personally one of my favorite, God's Grandeur, shows just how how our, our people have tried to destroy the beauty of the world and for some reason for some grace some unknown grace the world has its way of renewing itself let's go into god's grandeur god's grandeur the world is charged with the grandeur of God. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. It gathers to a greatness like the ooze of oil crushed. Why do men then now not wreck his rod? Generations have trod, have trod, have trod. And all is seared with trade, bleared, smeared with toil. And wears man's smudge and shares man's smell. The soil is bare now, nor can foot feel being shod. And for all this, nature is never spent. There lives the dearest freshness deep down things. And though the last lights of the black west went, Oh, morning, at the brown brink eastward springs, because the Holy Ghost over the bent world broods with warm breast and Ah, bright wings. So God's grandeur follow a basic form of Italian sonnet. And Italian sonnet has 14 iambic pentameter lines, uh, 8 in the first section and 6 in the second section. Uh, the first section is called the octave, while the second section is called the sestet. And in this poem, we see that... The world really is protected by the goodness of God. It starts by saying God's grandeur. And what we get from the title of the poem immediately is that God is a magnificent being. The title refers to the, su the supreme architect of much splendor and showing us there how God is in charge, uh, how God holds the world close to him. Right? It goes on to talk about, in the first line there, the world is charged. It's using their charge in the sense of lightning to give us the idea that the protection of the world is with God and the protection of the world is in such a way that it can be dangerous. Right? It goes on to say it will flame out like the shining from shook foil. Now when we hear the shining from shook foil, we think, we think about uh, when we fold a piece of foil, aluminum foil, you see that shining there as we fold the foil. So it's saying the world will burn out one day and it will burn out in such brilliance as though it's comparing it to aluminum foil or it's comparing it to something of magnificent shine. All right? It gathers to a greatness like the ooze of oil. That bit there is very important because they're comparing it to the production of olive oil and yeah they're comparing they're, they're talking about god here uh, so it's a metaphor and it's actually saying that the production of oil or god is as great as the production of oil and when you talk about production of olive oil it's made by crushing the olives 
in a slow process, it's a very slow process, which the rich full-bodied substance is slowly released. So in this in this sense here, they're comparing the goodness of God, and there you see a simile there, like ooze of oil. They're comparing the goodness of God to the slow process of God's splendor to give us the idea that sometimes God might be slow to act, but when he acts, it's a gratifying act. It's good. It makes us feel good about what happens as a result. So they're saying crushed. Yeah, the crushing means they're crushing the olive to make the oil, right? Why do men then now not wreck his rod? And this line here is simply, simply brilliant. That brilliant rhetorical question there is trying to ask us, why are we not afraid? Why are we not afraid of the wrath of God? Why are we not afraid of what God can do to us when we constantly ruin the earth he has provided us with? It says generations have trod, have trod, have trod. For generations, for years upon years, people have trampled, people have carelessly walked upon the earth, people have carelessly destroyed the earth, people have carelessly ruined what God has provided us with. Trot, trot, trot. That is onomatopoeia. It gives us the idea of the sound that is produced as they are trotting. You know, when you think about army uh, army men marching, good, trot, trot, trot. It gives us the idea that generations have done it so consistently that the world seems to be damaged by their presence. All is seared with trade, bleared, smeared with toil, telling us how men are, are working, how men have toiled, how men are destroying the earth as they, they, they tower their way or they power their way to civilization. And I want to stop there and think, and you think about that a little bit. So we are, we are busy with our everyday activity, we are busy cutting down trees, we are busy trying to power our way to civilization and we are ruining we are ruining the grace or we are ruining the gift of life the gift of the earth to us by god simply brilliant writing by manly it says where's man smudge and shares man smell the soil is bare now what's that telling us it's telling us that we cannot seem to undo what we have done at this point the soil the, the soil has obviously been affected by our actions or our non-actions and our life is obviously going to be affected because the soil is bare we cannot grow food and they say it goes on to talk about brilliantly nor can foot feel being shod now this is probably the most important first li the important line in the octave here because it tells us how men are blind to the damage they're causing how men are blind to what they're doing to the earth now think about if you're wearing shoes and that was, that's what Shad presents to us. If we're wearing shoes, we are blind to what is going on beneath our feet. All right. So the fact that we are wearing shoes protect our feet. So it says that because men somewhat might be going towards success or civilization, it somewhat blinds them from the harm that they're doing to the earth. All right. So let's let's go back a little bit here. The start of it says the world is charged. The word charge gives us the idea that the lightning can be quick. And obviously when we hear when we when we see lightning, it's a, in, in less than a second it gone it's gone. That gives us the idea that God can be quick. God can be quick in his judgment at one time, and then God can be like oil. When we are pouring oil, it can take some time to flow, right? So it gives us the idea that God at one point can be quick in his judgment, and in the next point, God can be slow and resourceful. I like that word, resourceful. God can be slow and re resourceful in his judgment. Because sometimes when we pray, we pray for our victory or, or our success, and it might be quick for us, but then other times it might be slow because it's probably God wants to teach us a lesson. 
and that there shows the nexus between what men are doing to the earth god can quickly damage and wipe out the entire generation or it can slowly find a way of renewing the graceness or renewing the the freshness of the earth is there anything else i want to say here uh yeah so when it comes down to the last line there I want us to pay, to have an understanding. I know we have all, we have all heard of the phrase "losing your soul while you gain the world." You know what is it? I think Bob Marley alluded to it. What would it profit a man to gain the world and lose his soul? I want us to paint to to get an image of man as man moves farther away from nature. As man moves farther away from nature, it is moving farther away from God. As man destroys nature, as mankind, when I say man, I mean mankind. As mankind destroys nature, he's moving farther away from God. So he's gaining the world in spiritual terms, gaining the world and losing his soul. All right. And it gives us the idea that for some reason, man's indifference and alienation from nature is akin to the indifference and separation from God. That's all I want to talk about there. We had a series of alliteration just introduced where it said, uh, shares man's smudge and share, wears man's smudge, shares man's smell, and the soil is bare. Those repetition of the S there, of course, is alliteration. But here we see a brilliant part. I want to talk a little bit here. Nature is never spent. Nature never dearest deep down things though last lights black west went well west went gives us the idea here it shows us how nature seems to be resilient despite all that we're doing when i say we i mean mankind not me <laughs> despite all mankind seems to be doing nature has this way of renewing itself huh? It's, it's amazing. Despite all that we are doing, God is still gifting us more freshness. Interesting. Why? Goodness, I guess. So, nature is never spent. There lives the dearest freshness deep down things. Deep down, as we are removing more and more of the earth, as we are damaging more and more of the earth, there seems to be newer freshness newer greens of things coming out and it says the last light of the black west went gives us the idea as the sun sets and as the morning rises now or as the day breaks that the world renews itself so the the night the night let's say the night is where man is damaging the earth and as morning brings as morning breaks now there is God's grace covering the earth, renewing the earth. That is the idea that presents to us. When it comes to that part that says the, whole, the Holy Ghost over the bent, that gives us the idea that salvation is on its way. It implies that somewhere along the line, God is renewing the freshness of the earth. All right. So let me see if anything else here I want to talk about. Yes, personification mentioned there. Holy Ghost broods. Broods gives us the idea it's pondering. Ponder. It's as though the Holy Ghost is pondering upon the earth, saying, you know what? I'll renew this. I'll renew the goodness. I'll renew the freshness of the earth. Even though you're ruining it, I will renew it. So that there gives a good idea of how God's grace can impact our life, our lives, even if we are not deserving of God's grace. <laughs> and that last line, I want to take into consideration broods, breasts, and wings. It's likened to me a chicken. It says comparing it, it's comparing the goodness of God, it's comparing the Holy Ghost, it's comparing the Trinity to a chicken or, an, or a hen which basically is telling us that God is protecting the earth as a mother hen would protect her chicks, all right? 
At the beginning of the poem, I spoke about the rhythmic effects of the poetry of Gerald Manley Hopkins, and in this likings, we must talk about the rhyme scheme of this sonnet here. Of course, you know the sonnet is 14 iambic pentameter line. The first eight is a sestet. The first eight is the octave, while the last six is a sestet. And we see a rhyme scheme being created where certain words rhyme at the end at the end of the sentence. So God, we can put A there. God rhymes with rod and also trod and also shot. So we can put A right where all of those words are rhyming because A is starting off there. And then we have foil. Uh, foil rhymes with oil. Foils, foil rhymes with uh, toil as well. Oil rhymes with toil. Toil, o soil, all of those rhyme there. My tongue is a bit twisted here. But nonetheless, it goes on to say in the second set section there, spent, spent of course doesn't rhyme with things, but rhymes with went. So spent, went, bent. And then we have things rhyming with springs and wings. So all of that there takes into account the brilliance behind Gerald Manley Hopkins' poem. If you want to know a little bit more about sonnets and their rhyme scheme, I can probably do another video on that. Just let me know and I'll do that for you. So we can compare this poem using themes such as nature, religion. I couldn't have thought of anything else, so if you know of anything else, you can probably hit me up and let me know that. And anything else your teacher would have taught you. Uh, when it comes to comparing this poem to another poem, a good comparison would be uh, sonnet, com sonnet Compiled on, or Composed, which was it? Sonnet Composed on Westminster Bridge. Uh, it's a brilliant comparison there. It shows us the two, I don't want to go too much into it, but shows us how nature seems to be not mindful of the presence of man. I'll just... Say that, say that there. As soon as I'm done with the comparison of that, as soon as I'm done with the analysis of that, uh, link would be in the description there for you to check that out. Go ahead and give me a thumbs up. Comment, let me know what you think. Subscribe so you can get updates and future postings. Like Guyanese would say, bye bye.